it was so funny because when I come from media to marketing, like um, I was actually like surprised and like, really people tune into webinars. I, I don't know about you, but like, that's the, that was like a funny, like aha moment to me, but I was like, I want to be the best webinar there is out there for my audience and their topics. I want it to be as compelling. I want it to have the best speakers. I want it to have the most high quality like experience in terms of like recording and format, um, all the things. So it's all about like creating experience out of and content powers that experience, right? So we took over as a content team, like, uh, determining what topics uh, all of our scheduled webinars would be. Uh, we took over the content for our conferences. Uh, so that's a little bit more of a run, I would say, but it's sort of like a walk to run. It's like a fast, mm-hmm. you know, speed, speed walking. Um, but we really like, you know, like our first virtual conference that we did, this was before uh, COVID like we got Kim Scott to come on and give like a whole seminar on radical candor and, you know, so on. But then like when we actually went full virtual, it was like, okay, how do we make our event pop? And it's really about like the content that we're putting into that space. So we booked like Trevor Noah to come and did do a talk about DEI. And um, we, you know, we had, like recent, more recently, we had like Adam Grant and Serena Williams come be part of our. So it's all about like, how do I program the best show that my audience is going to see as a must see, a must consume, a must share, really. So events is a huge part of your voice. It's a huge part of your content strategy. Um, it's a tough one because not all teams are willing to share that value, right? Like, because every, I think a lot of marketing teams have events teams within and the events team tends to either outsource or do the content themselves. But having a content hand in the selection, because you want your company to understand, I understand this audience best. And so I'm, I know the topics that they're talking about. I know the angles that will appeal to them the best. Like, are they more conservative? Are they more progressive? Like, how do I frame the conversation so that it feels really palatable to that audience that's going to consume? So events was definitely like our second sort of our our first step into the walk. Mm -hmm. Do you get big name speakers for all the webinars too? Or is that just for the big conferences? (laughs) So it depends on our goals. So if we, if demand is trying to like do a a massive like push into uh, like, oh, let's try and get like massive RSVPs for this one webinar per quarter. So like last year we did a series called one-on-one that where we wanted to get like three to 5,000 RSVPs for each webinar. So we knew that we would need some kind of premier name to draw those kinds of RSVPs. So um, we, we did that. We had like Chris Ye, who's an author of it come in and uh, actually Kim had Kim Scott had just come out with her new book about DEI we had her come on to talk about DEI. And so it, it we, I would say it was like sort of like um, a higher caliber of guests than we usually have. And we did like have budget set aside to mm-hmm. pay them to come. Um, but that was because we had high goals. And so I think you have to just think about what are your goals for your webinars? Can like just a panel of practitioners, like HR leaders, in my case, um, drive that kind of sign up. And if not, like, what can you do to like, move the needle with through guest selection? So it it sounds like big names do help draw a crowd, which makes sense to me. But let's like leave that dimension aside. What? Because we're we're doing a lot of events, right? Like we do webinars, and we're planning like a pretty big event, a three day kind of virtual summit. So yes. what are the the secrets to good mm-hmm. good product in terms of like your events like topic selection how mm-hmm. they actually present like what are what are the other things that actually make good events good Yes 
a lot of preparation and good guest selection is is like the first step, right? And guest selection doesn't have to be prim- like like famous people. It can literally be just people who are super knowledgeable. Um, like our like one of our um, one of our first virtual events we did um, out of, in in pandemic. We were like really focused on like what are the companies whose leaders we would want to hear from Mm -hmm. or who are actually doing like innovative things that have like great stories behind them. So it's, it it was more about like curating great stories and, and voices. And like, some of it is like, I would go on and listen to them on a podcast and, Oh, they, they have this great story and they're really fun. And, or I'd go see a talk that they did and, you know, in, in the before times, um, where it was like, wow, they're super engaging. They have this great presentation that goes along. And so you have to do a bit of homework to find those, those voices and those stories for sure. Um, and sometimes they'll pitch them to you, right. If, especially if you develop like a little bit of a name or you do a shout out on your socials or whatever, um, apply to speak and you can usually come across some really great gems that way. Um, then like preparing the speaker. So if you have a moderator, right. Making sure that person really knows how to do it. Right. Cause like a, a good host or moderator can make or break Alex, as you probably know, um, uh, a conversation and then, um, you know, really doing a bit of a, like a prep call with those speakers, making sure they understand the flow, all those things like lead to like great experiences later. Cause, uh, then there's like, no wasted time. Like there's great conversation through and through. Uh, yeah. I like, I like to reverse engineer uh, these things to a certain extent and think about yeah. like the opposite, like what, what is bad about most webinars? Cause a lot of <laughs> webinars are bad. They're, they're boring or like they're undifferentiated. And then I try to right. do the opposite if I can. And maybe the opposite's also bad. Like that's a test that I'm willing to take. But yes. when I worked at, um, a company called CXL, like we we launched like a mm-hmm. webinar program. So we, we launched uh, this platform for education called CXL Institute. And I figured, mm-hmm. okay, we've got all these instructors who are practitioners and thought leaders in their fields. Like, why don't we just promote their actual content with a, a, a mini form of content in the form of a webinar? And right. I looked around at all the other webinars and thought like, all right, there's like 20 minute long introductions for some reason and a bunch of background yes. research and theory. And then there's like a sales pitch that's kind of, interweave yes. through the thing but then there's you know a long one at the end i'm like what if i scrapped all that and just like didn't barely intro them like just let them go they didn't have mm-hmm. slides they just like showed their screen and showed how to do something concretely and made it full That's of tactical great. wisdom instead of like this fluffy high level thing but mm-hmm. i like that kind of reverse engineered approach and it, this is kind of a long way to ask this question but like no no yeah what what, what are the um what are the pitfalls that you should avoid in terms <laughs> of like webinars like what are the common things i almost yeah. certainly like it's going to be like pushing too hard of a sale or something like that. But what what else have you seen in terms of like common mistakes marketers are making? I would agree with all the things you've already flagged. Like thought leadership is like really the way to go and not making it too prescriptively like a, any kind of sales pitch is pretty key. Um, people will literally log out and not come back if they feel it's too salesy. And we, um, anytime we have like a little bit of a salesy anything in any of our content, like we get comments back or NPS like back from uh from the like a survey that, that tells us that. So we try to avoid that. And it's like, let's leave that as like, let's like the goal here is really like to make Lattice look like an ally to this viewer, right? We get you, we understand your pain. So, you know, that's, it's very high level and very thought leadershipy. I would also say, um, like, I want to go back to that moderator being a key point, um, Mm. knowing how to get out of the way of answers. (laughs) Like when people, when you ask a question, let them answer it. I'm so shocked at, I I, I get like wanting to create um, conversational like a conversational vibe on a podcast and like having discussion, but 90% of it is like knowing when to pull back and like, let them open up and talk. And especially some speakers take a while to, you know, get to the point exactly, but 
you have to know like when to sort of step in and help and when to just like give it a little room, a little air to breathe and like get the the really good shit out there. <laughs> so part of my French. So no, yeah, no, you can swear. It's fine. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so uh, I, I do think it's really critical. Um, like uh, so many, uh, sometimes it's just like knowing how, like, especially if you have like time limits and that sort of thing, which like, you know, webinars, I think are tend to be like an, like an hour long or maybe a little less. You want to get to a bunch of things. You want to like cover a bunch of topics, but you also just have to like prepare I, or this is what I do anyway, um, prepare like which cut questions I'm willing to like give up and cut and which I really, really want the audience to come away with front load it with those questions first, like know if I'm at a certain cutoff point, like to stop asking questions after a certain bit. And, um, and I also think it's really key to also create some sort of interactivity in web webinars where you can. So we do lots of polling. We collect questions ahead of time from the audience. We take questions always off of the Q and a as well at the end. It's so hard to leave time for that, but um, having interactivity really makes people more invested um, and feel more engaged because they just feel like they're being seen and heard and everybody loves that. You know, that cutting skill, that cutting component, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I think for sure. many people, but for me, I've, I've noticed it in an editorial um, lens. And like when I write content, I yeah. have trouble writing less than 4,000 words. If it were up to me, <laughs> these podcasts would all be several hours long. I would take like the the like Joe Rogan, you know, five hour long marathon right. conversation style. Yeah. But I know that like, you know, that there's a niche for that. But like also like I want to make it palatable to the audience that I'm serving. So yes. um, I don't know. How do you how do you it's develop tough. that skill? It's it feels more psychological than anything, right? Like being able to like say this is a five out of ten idea, so that it doesn't yeah. pass my bar of like an eight out of ten idea. So we're going to scrap that out, even though it might be marginally valuable. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. How do you approach that? Well, I I think that's the media slash editor in me, right? That's um, I've always. I, I mean, I've come up through all kinds of different kinds of media, but most of what I do is I'm an editor, I'm a curator and curating the message I want. Like when I'm editing an article or an ebook, it's like, this is the primary hook I want the, the reader to come away with. And I want everything within it to hang off of that hook. And it makes it much easier to say, this doesn't hang on that hook you know, I have to cut it. Like, let's just like, cause it really like makes the message cleaner and makes you seem like a more focused, um, uh, uh, deliverer content creator. Um, if you can do that, if you can sort of like winnow down and come to, uh, a, a, I think so, but there are obviously moments where you just want to let people like talk, um, and let it be free form. Um, I think it's just being wise about how often you do that in your content mix mm -hmm. and how often you make it more focused and curated and edited down. Mm -hmm.